Hello and welcome to today's European SharePoint Office 365 and Azure Community Webinar. My name is David and I am delighted to be joined by Asif Rimani, MVP MCT of Visual SP USA, who will be talking to you today about five things for immediate impact on increasing shared up, SharePoint adoption. Remember to join the conversation about today's webinar on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at European SharePoint, apologies, at European SP, and our hashtag is hashtag ESPC19. Don't forget to check out the Resource Center. This is packed with the latest blogs, eBooks, webinars, and how-to videos. Simply visit sharepointeurope.com and click the content link at the top. Have you and your team been working on a product, solution, or project that you are proud of? Whether it's a simple and effective solution or a larger, more complex transformation, we invite you to enter this year's European SharePoint, Office 365, and Azure Community Awards. Visit sharepointeurope.com for more details. The closing date for submissions is September 25th, 2019. After the webinar, we will have questions and answers uh, session. Type any questions you have for Asif in the questions window. Questions will be selected and answered at the end of the presentation. This webinar will be recorded and added to the Resource Center where you will be notified by email when it's available. I'm now going to pass you over to our webinar presenter, Asif Rahmani. Hello, Asif. Yes, hello. Joining here from Chicago, United States. Morning over here, so good morning to whoever is from here. Others who are joining in from Europe, good afternoon. Uh, do you want me to go ahead and take the screen? Actually. Absolutely, I'm sharing the screen now. Okay. So, over to you. Alrighty. I'm gonna go ahead and do it, and then let me know when you can see it. You able to see my screen? Yes. Okay, so hello everybody. Thank you very much for joining me. My name is Asif Rahmani, as David mentioned. Uh, first, before I start, there's a quick survey that I like people to take who come to my sessions when I do them in the United States and actually in Europe as well. Uh, this is the link to the survey, visualsp.link slash SP survey. Very easy, not that painful type of survey. Let me click on it and show you exactly what it looks like. Here we go. So it just asks a few questions like um, the SharePoint and which version are you in, uh, which services are you using in your company and things like that. There's only a few like this. The reason for that is I have you do this survey, then I show it to you within the actual session that we're going to do here. It's good for you to also know what kind of people are thinking about uh, this topic that we're all talking about right now, which is SharePoint adoption. You know, which company are you in? Uh, I'm sorry, not a physical company. What I mean is what uh, type of people, what kind of uh, company you uh, you keep basically of the people that are, that are talking about this thing. Hope that makes sense. So if you could fill out this survey, I would appreciate that. I'm gonna go ahead and move on. So it's visualsp.link slash SP survey, and then I'll come back to the results of the survey in a few minutes. All right, what I'm gonna also do maybe is maybe David can help me also is put this in the chat. I'm gonna go ahead and see if I can put it in chat here. Uh, no, it won't let me put that here. So David, if you could, I'm gonna go ahead and put it into the chat for us. And if you could put it in the chat for the attendees, I would appreciate that. And I'll keep going here. So in terms of the presentation, the main things that uh, people come for for this presentation, they're thinking about the following, that they're putting in so much effort, so many things in their SharePoint environment, but end users just don't seem to care. They're not doing uh, what they really want them to do. Right? The adoption type activities are happening without seeing much benefit from those activities. And they're providing training and content to people, but <laughs> still they don't see that many people actually using it. So what's going on? Why are these things not working? That's the frame of mind that people usually come with when they come to a session 
like mine over here. The presentation's title is five things for immediate impact on increasing ship on adoption. You might have more things that you think of when you're thinking about, when you're looking at the presentation, you're thinking about things. If you do have specific things that you can think of, I would love to hear them, by the way. So there's a chat, like I mentioned before, I believe you can chat back and forth. If you can put more information in the chat back to me, I would love to read it out to everybody. Uh, there are definitely other ways of doing you know, increasing shipper adoption as well. But these are the ones that I'll be talking about. That these are the ones that I have worked for myself or the clients that I've worked with. And uh, I've been in this game for a very long time. Speaking of which, uh, actually, before I move on from this slide, I introduce myself more formally. Here's where you can download the presentation if you like, visualsp.link slash conference. And uh, that's my Twitter, Twitter ID. So here's who I am. Uh, my name, once again, Asif Ramani. I'm from Chicago, Illinois, United States. That's where I'm speaking from today as well. Great to be here, invited by European Ship on Conference to, de to deliver this webcast. Here's my contact information. Feel free to get in touch with me anytime you like. I've been doing this share pointy stuff for quite some time, 2002 to be specific. And then I've been involved in Office 365 uh, even before it came out. Uh, with the beta version and before that. Along the way, I've had a chance to write a few books as well. They were pretty technical back in the day. I started with some of the programming content that I was writing before, and then I went on to power user and then end users. But uh, honestly, end users are the hardest to train, to be honest. You know, getting user adoption from end users, getting them to tr be trained, I found that to be harder than doing it for developers and administrators, believe it or not. Um, I'm from the company Visual SP, and I've been an MVP with Microsoft since 2007. So I love helping people, and that's why Microsoft recognizes me from uh, the MVP perspective. The problem I feel that we all have in the industry is the following. Now, we have this thing called SharePoint, right? Or now, of course, many of you are struggling with SharePoint plus all the other apps in Office 365. So it's got this beautiful thing, and, and I'm just representing it with this um, uh, huge plane. Think of this as your SharePoint environment, your intranet environment, or maybe SharePoint and Office 365 apps completely. The, you know, you decked it out with all the cool stuff inside. There's so much stuff, uh, so many things inside, so many facilities, amenities. However, the problem is, and this problem is a pretty big one, is um, where are the passengers? Right? What's wrong with these pictures is there's no passengers. And I see this time and time again in many, many intranets where the usage is not that high. People are not actually coming to the intranet or not using the Office 365 apps. And that's what we're going to be talking about. As we're talking about this thing, also keep in mind that you don't want to make the same mistakes again. And I'm not saying that you guys have made mistakes. Hopefully you haven't. But there are many, many companies out there who are making the same mistakes again and again when they're going from SharePoint 2003 to 2007 to 2010 to 2013, 2016, 2019, SharePoint Online, etc. You don't want to do that because that's what Albert Einstein would say would be the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results that, oh, we're going to get more users using our uh, intranet. Why? Why? Why would they do that? That why is super, super important. Okay, if you already tried training them, if you already tried uh, threatening them, <laughs> if you already tried providing great resources to your people and nothing has worked, then why is it gonna work this time? So it, maybe it's time to try something different. One of the things I talk about a lot is a concept of user adoption as a service. You don't just do user adoption for a week at the launch time or a month or even for three months. It's more of a user adoption as a service, not as a project approach. What I mean by that is not that this becomes your full-time job. That's not what I'm saying. However, there's gotta be an ongoing way of supporting users, helping them do their job. The more you automate things, the better it'll be for you and better it'll be for them. And how that could happen is some of the things we're gonna be talking about here. What kind of uh, processes you can put into place what kind of um, 
a man, uh, support you can provide them as well. So it just it just works for them. Okay. A good friend of mine here in the United States, Sarah Haas, she also speaks a lot of the about the same things that I speak about. Was it user adoption? I really like this quote from her, and I put into my presentation that user adoption is a journey, not a destination. If you stop investing and engaging your users, adoption will slow and eventually die out. Right? Sarah has worked for some pretty big corporations here in the United States, such as uh, Best Buy. Best Buy is a pretty big retailer here, electronic stores, and they went through the same things. Right? She was the Sherpa admin over there. Same challenges. They eventually made a champions program, and which I'll be talking about in my presentation also, and that worked wonders actually for them. But you have to be very specifically invested in engaging your users so they want to use what you provide them. That's the main story here. So without further delay, let's talk about number one thing. Look for and solve a critical problem. All right, look for and solve a critical problem. Why? Because it's all about WIIFM. What is WIIFM? If you if you were in my my presentation room right now, I would ask you guys uh, if anybody knows, raise your hand and let me know. Unfortunately, I can't see you through the wire through online here, so I'm going to tell you what it is. Um, WIIFM is what's in it for me. That's important for everybody. It's important for my kids, for example, anywhere, you know, uh, young kids, adults, seniors, don't matter who you are, male, female, information worker, non-information worker, everybody's thinking about what's in it for me when they're doing certain things, all right? It could even be altruistic reasons as to it gives me satisfaction, but even then, at the end of the day, in our brain, the first thing that comes to my mind is, why am I doing this? What's in it for me? Now, before you even get to this thing, you have to make sure that executives also understand about this issue, what's in it for them. And if there's an actual challenge, they need to understand that challenge before going and you know, you know, being on your side uh, to help you, uh, to help the users. Uh, I've noticed also that when executives are not on your side, then nothing that you do works, unfortunately. Just nothing, doesn't matter. The executive sponsorship has to be there before you even try to solve your, the pain points of your users. Uh, what I found also for this one is executives love data. So if they're not on your site already, show them the data, all right? The type of data, for example, you could show, and that's just one of the examples, is a SharePoint challenge survey, all right? Uh, what is the biggest SharePoint challenge? These kind of surveys have already happened. In, in fact, there's one that I'm showing you over here. If you go to visualspeed.link slash SP challenge survey, you'll get to this thing that you can download and have available. When 376 organizations were asked, what is your biggest SharePoint challenge? What'd they say? 32% said increasing adoption. Right after that, 21%. Governance, being able to let people know what they should and should not do and why policy communication, things like that, and then self-help, okay? So these things are big challenges and executives need to understand that this is the challenge so they can get behind you with the support, okay? Looking for and solving the biggest challenges is definitely the way to go, but even before that, make sure the executives are on your side and then you move forward. Now, before moving on, I'm gonna tell you a quick story here. Now, I know I have limited time, so I need to make sure I keep the time in front of me. All right, um, this, let's make this quick. In Tennessee, United States, we actually, we meaning our company actually did a project uh, quite some time ago. And I, I wanna tell you the story because I think this is gonna help you a lot understanding the pain point and what I'm talking about over here. What's a pain point, what's not a pain point over here. So here's, here's a story. In Tennessee, there were two buildings owned by uh, an organization which actually was being funded by Department of Defense, which as you know, in Department of Defense, United States, they have a lot of money. That's not a problem. So it's building one, building two. Building one is where executives sat. Sorry, bad writing. Building two was where the PMs, the secretaries, uh, the engineers, all of them sat over here. Okay, so engineers, maybe I'll put that down here. All right, 
in this uh, corporation, in this place over in the company, we were actually brought in as a team to look at inefficiencies and try to solve those inefficiencies with SharePoint. This is back in the day of, I believe, SharePoint 2010 at that time. We were brought in, we went straight to building two first. And the first thing that we saw is there was a secretary. Okay, this secretary over there, her main job was to uh, run reports and then present those reports to executives. She ran the reports using Excel, Excel 2010, I believe. And then she uh, went walking to the other building every morning to present that report to the executives. Excel 2010 on the desktop, not Excel services, not SharePoint. They did it, she did it over there. And then she walked to the other building to show the report to them. We thought, well, that's a pain point right there. Let's solve it. And our answer was, let's, we're gonna use Excel services, we'll use reporting services, we'll use dashboards, we're gonna use alerts. So uh, reporting services runs after the Excel services has computed everything. It sends out an alert to executives, it shows them a dashboard, she can put in some comments and everything can happen within minutes, right? Before we could implement that, we had two stakeholders that we needed to talk to. First, we had to talk to her over here and explain to her that's what's gonna happen. We explained it to her and asked her, does this make sense? Is this what we're gonna do? Uh, her answer was no, this doesn't make any sense. What I'm doing right now, it's working fine. I'm not trying. To, I'm not sure why you're trying to change all the processes on me. Uh, obviously change is hard for her, for everybody, change is hard. So we understood, fine. Then we went to the executives over here and we asked them, executives, what do you think? This is our plan. It's not gonna cost you that much. We can do most of the stuff in no code ways and it's gonna save you this much money, this much time. Now, what they said surprised us because we thought this was a home run easily. What happened there was they said, no, this doesn't make sense. Now, the moral of the story is the answer that they gave, okay? The answer they gave was, listen, this process is working not just because she comes in and presents the data to us. It, there are a couple other things that you have to remember. One is that when she's there, we can ask her any questions we have about the report, about the data, about all the trends and stuff like that. And the human interaction is wonderful every day that we can get. But even more than that, even more than that, we know that these people, the PMs and engineers have their own lives, have their own frustrations and things like that. And when she comes over every day, we get to ask her about how things are going, how things are going in building two, okay? That, the, the water cooler type of conversations that are happening and what she's telling us uh, that's happening every day, that's priceless. How do you replace that with technology? And we had no answer. You can't replace that with technology. Once again, the reason I'm telling you this story, and sorry if we got too long over here, but it's important, is because this seemed like a pain point that we were looking to solve, but there was no pain point. Yes, it took her half a day to do this every day, but the executives and the secretary herself were super happy with the way things were going. It was necessary. Look for a true pain point. Otherwise, if you make a mistake like we almost did, where if we had solved for this apparent pain point, nobody would have used it, okay? So that's the story in here. Hopefully this helps. There's a website here in the United States which is very popular. It's called Craigslist. <clears throat> now, I know in, United, in Europe also this exists, but not, I'm not sure how many people are actually using it. But the point over here is that look at how this website looks. I, I think personally it's a terrible looking website. There's no branding. It's just a bunch of links. Uh, this came out way back where we had classified ads here in papers and the people used to go to classified ads to find services, computer services, or you know, uh, other kind of services, uh, items wanted, things like that. When this website came, when this website came, it almost killed the business for classified ads. Why? Because it solved a pain point. It solved a problem that was there and it had great adoption because it solved that problem. Not because it looked great, but because the function was great, okay? So keeping this in mind, I've seen also SharePoint sites, which look terrible. <laughs> they do look terrible, but they have so much great adoption. 
and vice versa, where I've seen some great looking websites, which look great intranet, I should say, which have terrible adoption, right? So we wanna keep that in mind, in my opinion. You don't wanna just onboard people. You, you want to make sure that you focus on business outcomes. Business outcomes, even if it's one, two, three, five things that you are giving them, very, very specific outcomes where you can measure them and say, all right, they're able to, for example, file a expense reimbursement from beginning to finish and get their money quickly, which everybody cares about. You go to a conference, you go to a trip, business trip, you come back, you file an expense reimbursement. Everybody does that, right? Or asset tracking or many things like that where you can do, it's gotta be something that has to be on that intranet that's quick and easy for them. And uh, once they realize that business outcome, only then they'll be using that more and more often. Some of the examples of real challenges from the field, because of course you want to make things solid and real, not just talk about these things. So I'm gonna give you some, is for example, onboarding salespeople to get revenue in the door quickly. For companies that are selling, for companies that have salespeople, this is very important for them. They need to get salespeople onboarded quickly, right? The quicker they onboard, the quicker the revenue can come in from them, and that's what all matters, obviously. Second, and, the, and by the way, these examples that I'm putting in are the real challenges that we have seen, and many of them have been solved without using any code whatsoever. They were quick, they were uh, lean processes that were put into place, and uh, people started using them right away because this, this was a true, true pain point. Not because it looked great, but because it worked great. Second one, this is what I was talking about, ex easier expense reimbursement process to get employees their money back faster. Providing one place for a person to see all their assigned tasks. There you go. Easily filterable list of authorized vendors, resellers of your company. Organization of companies trade show booth. We, for example, do boots all the time also in the United States. In fact, we've done it at the European SharePoint Conference also for Visual SP. And, and being able to organize all these things within a SharePoint solution, intranet solution, using lists and dashboards and things like that makes it so much easier. Okay. Ability to print to the nearest printer. So this might seem weird. So what, do you, what do you mean? Ability to print to the nearest printer. This was uh, one of the other presentation that I do, it talks about a corporation, Sony Corporation, which I know all of you know. Uh, Sony Corporation has been around for so long. They had this big need of helping people to print to the nearest printer, their mobile workers especially. And this was a big, big problem. They solved that problem by putting a web part directly on the top right-hand corner of SharePoint, their new SharePoint intranet. And if you go there, you click one button, you can connect to the nearest printer automatically. But guess what? This web part and this functionality was only available through their SharePoint intranet, nowhere else. So people had to go there. They had to do it this way, okay? So hopefully this helps. Um, uh, I don't know how much time I have. I have so many stories that I could tell you guys, but uh, I wanna be cognizant of time as well here. This one, I'm gonna give you a very short form of this story and then we'll move on because we have a four things to talk about as well. Um, my dad was very opposed to the iPhone when it first came out. Well, even for until a few years ago, he was like, I don't need a smartphone. Why do I need a smartphone? Um, the way we solved this, or I shouldn't say, I, I solved it. Uh, the way I got in the smartphone is because he wanted something that was in the smartphone. Uh, doesn't matter, iPhone, Android, right? He does have an iPhone. I'm an Android guy, but that's besides the point. The reason he got the a smartphone at the end of the day was because he felt left out of, of our family conversations that were happening in WhatsApp. Um, he resisted, resisted, resisted until he saw himself that, hey, I'm missing out on all these conversations that are happening in WhatsApp. There's a huge group of 35 people in there and I'm not there. So he wanted WhatsApp. He didn't want his smartphone. At the end of the day, he wanted a WhatsApp. <laughs> and I told him, dad, if you want WhatsApp, you got to get a smartphone. I can't give it to you in your uh, rotary phone or your you know, flip phone that you have. So he went to iPhone. And once he went to the iPhone, then he started discovering other things as well. But the point of the story here, and it's a quick one this time, is that he wanted something. And 
I gave him that thing in the form of what I wanted to give him anyway. And then he discovered other things. So first you gotta help the users with what they want before you can give them what you want to give them. That's a very, very important point in my mind. Solution that can be built in days or weeks, not months, not years. So you want to solve a real challenge and delight your team. You, the formula for for creating uh, you know, these solutions is you want to do it uh, with people who are your evangelists, your believers, your champions. They're the ones who are gonna help you spread this knowledge. And that's actually my number two. Identify and support champions and evangelists in each department. You, they're always already there. You don't have to make anybody a champion or an evangelist. You just have to identify them. So what I mean by that is influencers in each department already exist. There's always this Sarah. There's always this Tim, this John, who's everybody's running to. Say, hey, John, could you help me? Hey, Sarah, could you help me with uh, this thing? And I'm looking to make an Excel macro or I'm trying to do this in PowerPoint or something. Now, these are influencers which is within each department, within each office. Those are the people that you want to get on your side. You need champions because they're just one of you, usually. I talk to so many people around the world, literally, uh, and they tell me that oh, I'm the only SharePoint admin in my company. Oh, it's so difficult, 5,000 people, 10,000 people. Sometimes there's two people who are the <laughs> SharePoint admins and now the SharePoint and Office 365 admins. And it's difficult. You have to, you need help. You need other ownership and accountability ac across departments and across business roles. These champions will help you create and sustain the excitement that you want there to be there. You can't push all by yourself. You, you need local and uh, decentralized support from uh, these folks. Trust me, this, this really works. These power users, like I said, they're already there. Um, you just need to identify them and get them on your side. Obviously, the next question comes, why would anybody want to be a champion? You know, that's additional responsibility, additional workload. Why would they want to do it? I'll tell you why they would not want to do it first, okay? Many people think, okay, well, we need to reward them in terms of uh, bonuses, in terms of higher salary, because that's going to increase their, uh, uh, you know, the job responsibility. I've never seen that work. I I've never, literally never seen that work. When you give more money to someone as a main motivator, that sounds counterintuitive, but that never works. It's not more money that most people want. It's additional types of things that you can give them that's gonna motivate them. And, and these things always work, by the way. One of these things at least always work. For example, increased visibility to senior management. You know, their own exposure to senior management goes up. They have a say in the direction of the technology that you're gonna be using. So before you roll out Planner, before you roll out Microsoft Teams, or before you roll out uh, modern uh, sites on your intranet, ex existing intranet, you are talking to them, you're conversing as to, all right, here's what we're gonna do, here's how we're gonna do it, and you're letting them ask questions, and then it becomes their baby as well. They're the ones who are involved in it. Okay, that helps a lot. Help define and shape business policies. Okay, so they're the ones who actually, not just technology, but also business policies and regulation stuff, they can also help with that. And then also visible distinction of honor, bragging rights, that always works as well. In fact, uh, we had actually made this badge of honor that we give out, <laughs> uh, SharePoint guy, SharePoint gal. So we took the logo of uh, SharePoint, we took the logo of Superman, Superwoman, and we actually combine it together to make stickers like these. And they, many people go ahead and put it on their laptop or put it on their um, walls, and cubicles or offices. And honestly, even things like this really help because you're awarding these things to the right people, not giving it to everybody, but just you're awarding, awarding it to the main people. And all these things truly, truly work, okay? <clears throat> so hopefully this helps. Number three, because uh, we are short on time, focus on context, not only content. Um, there was a time when access to content was a challenge. There was not that much content out there. We don't have that challenge anymore. The new challenge is a lack of context. It's not the content, okay? There's, in fact, there's too much content available these days, I'll argue. 
in fact, so much so that when I look at, for example, my kids and others, I worry that, oh my God, how are they going to understand where to go to get what information, the right information at the right time? Because there's so much fragmented information everywhere. There's a lot of content on Bing, Google, YouTube, uh, outside, inside your company, everywhere. It's just too much. Okay. The challenge is people are finding the right things and they're finding the wrong things. So the bad practices along with the great practices, that's not good. You want them to find the right practices, the best practices possible, obviously. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you one again, uh, another story. And I really hope these stories help you because, uh, uh, well, they've, they've helped me a lot and I've gotten a lot of good feedback from my conference attendees also that they've helped them. So I'll, I'll make this one a quick one as well. Uh, since we are short on time. Okay, there was an experienced trainer. She was really, really good at Exchange and other things, Microsoft Exchange, and she came to me to ask for my, uh, SharePoint help. This is a long time ago, but I was already doing a lot of SharePoint work at that time, so I was pretty recognized in the community. She came to me because she found me online. She said, hey, I need uh, to understand this quote-unquote SharePoint thing. Could you teach me? And uh, she's like 15, 20 years my senior, uh, very, very well-spoken, experienced trainer, more experienced than I was already at that time. But we met at a coffee shop, okay? She wanted the help, and I said, sure, let's do it. First thing she did, she opened up her laptop. Okay, she opened up her laptop and started showing me, here's what I got so far. I'm about to roll this out tomorrow, and I, I just need some quick answers, so I'm on my way. In an hour, we should be done. I mean, not many pleasantries at all. <laughs> she was just all business. Let's get this going. Let's get this done. All right. So picture this. Now, I'm assuming many of you are on the call who uh, who are SharePoint admins, or at least have been and understand SharePoint Central Administration back in the day, especially if maybe it's the current reality for you, SharePoint servers administering it. So here's what she had. She had a web application, SharePoint Central Administration, which is a web application, right? So SharePoint Central Administration, uh, she showed me that and then she said, okay, I made this SharePoint site collection under the SharePoint Central Administration and I'm going to invite all of my people in the company, all of them <laughs> in the site collection so they can start managing documents, sharing information, blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, I didn't even know this was possible. Why would you make a site collection under SharePoint Central Administration. Yes, you can technically, but why would you do that? That's a really, really bad practice. Now, I didn't tell her that. I just said, whoa, 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 okay, hang on a second. There's a better way. You want to segment that out. You want to have a separate web application that's your true intranet. Within that, you want to make a site collection. And I don't want to go too technical here, but I, I think you understand what I'm saying, that this was a big no-no. You don't want it to be a same web application where Central Administration is there and a collaboration is happening there. But how would she know? That's not her fault. How would she know? She saw this on a, on a video or some kind of blog or something, and she just started doing it. Like, oh my God, this, this was a big issue that was waiting to happen. So you want to make sure the right information get to the right people at the right time, okay? Otherwise, you're gonna have a big, big problem. Now, the easiest way to do it, the best way to perform that knowledge transfer from your head to your user's head would be the following. Unfortunately, this is not possible yet. We can't just transfer information just like that by infusing the information directly from our head to user's heads. So the next best way is to deliver just-in-time help to users. Just in time and just enough help. Okay? You don't want users to blindly follow the advice that they find on the internet because that's exactly what happened with her as well. That's a bad idea. You want the end users uh, to have the information right there where they're working you want to deliver the help in place. They're not usually motivated to look for those answers outside. Some some will on Google, on Bing, but they might find, or they will find, uh, the wrong answers as well as the right answers. So you want to be careful of that. You also want to not overwhelm them with too much information. So I've had many, many companies who's made, um, and I'm talking about many, many companies that I've seen who have made amazing looking wiki sites with uh, hundreds of videos and screenshots and documents and all kinds of stuff. And then they look at the traction of how many people are actually using that wiki site, that training site, and it's not many people who are doing it. 
Not because the content is not great, the content is great. The problem is that uh, it's somewhere over there that people have to remember to go to when they need it and not many people actually do it. You wanna provide the content, uh, you wanna provide the content, the education, the help directly in context to where they are. That's super, super important. In context help directly on in the environment. Uh, I'm not going to this right here, but in my conference sessions, I actually show exactly how I <clears throat> even created the slide deck in PowerPoint with some contextual help that Microsoft provided me. <laughs> but we're gonna skip that right now. Um, a few minutes, I'm gonna go ahead and take a break also and show you those results that I was talking about before the survey results, but let's keep going for now. Uh, there's a good way, there's a better way, and I believe that there's a best way also of giving contextual help to users. Now, I'm calling it help, I'm not calling it training because that's exactly what it is, is in context help to users, okay? One is you can have these quick reference sheets like this one. So for example, this one is a regular SharePoint Classic site. This one is a modern document library. In both of these things, you can go ahead and uh, print out something like this and give it to users. They can have it on their desk, or they can have it on their screen when they're onboarding to a new interface, right? Or even if they've been there for a while, but they don't understand what is this ellipsis gonna do for me? What is this I gonna do for me? And things like this. This is pretty helpful to have um, a screenshot like this directly on your screen or uh, on your uh, desktop as a user to reference, right? So there are some quick reference sheets like this you can find here if you like. SP quick reference, visualspeed.link SP quick reference, you'll find that there. Take advantage of that, I would suggest. Okay, <clears throat> the second best way, in my opinion, is providing just in time, just in context delivery uh, from, from your, uh, from within the web parts, from within the pages where you are. So you have link to governance about documents about, uh, uh, how, for example, file naming recommendations or best practices. They're just embedded directly onto the page. Uh, I think this is a great idea because before they're uploading files, they can look at the file naming recommendations and then do that accordingly. The problem that I found with this one or the challenge is that you have to do it manually, then you have to maintain it manually for everything. Uh, that that could be a lot. There's a, <laughs> Uh, if you have to do it for every single document library, there's a lot to maintain. Otherwise, this is really a, a good way of doing so. Uh, another way of doing so, actually, let me pause my screen here for a second so I can switch. The other way of doing so is the following. I'll show you uh, one way that we do it within our company. Obviously, there's many other solutions like that also, so whatever makes sense for you. But, okay, so I'm unpausing it now. What you're looking at is OneDrive. So if I, if as a user, if I'm at OneDrive or if I'm at SharePoint, if I'm wherever I am, I should be able to get help directly where I am. So there should be something, for example, like that. Need help? Yes, I need help. And you click on it as a user and then you get help right there. Okay, so that's what we do as, a, as Visual SP, the company over here. For example, modern document library quick reference, what I was showing you before, something like this appears directly onto the page. So it's right there, it's not somewhere else, it's not even on my desk, it's right there. I see that. Okay, that's a quick reference sheet. Or if I click on syncing, how do I sync files to my computer? And guess what? It just points to it and say, oh yeah, this is how you do it. Oh, great, thank you. And then they click on it. <clears throat> or let's see. Uh, SharePoint permissions and groups, what are they all about? You can click on it and they actually see a document in this case, hopefully. It's a test environment, so some of the stuff is not here. Okay, what is a document library? Things like this, all this information is right there at my fingertips. Creating new documents, what do I do here? You know, all that stuff is right there, creating a document. Uh, basically providing them help directly in context and that's done in this case with Visual SP. You can do that with, uh, any kind of system like that, okay. You wanna get the help as close as possible to the user. That's at the end of the day, what you want to do. You move on over here. 
Number four, peer-to-peer -peer learning. Social learning is key in today's world. Uh, um, I have a long story over here too, which which I'll uh, skip at this time. <clears throat> but training end users in uh, in just anywhere doesn't really work. Traditional training is not for end users, is my firm belief. You can definitely train people who are developers, administrators, power users, but true end users, they don't want to get trained, they want to get their job done. And there's a difference. So instead of training them, you help them, you support them, you help them for what's in it for them. All right, they really cannot be made to do things they don't, they don't want to do. So if they don't really want to learn the newest features of SharePoint or Office 365, no matter what you do, there's it's just not going to happen unless you want to you know get to extreme measures, which I don't recommend. <laughs> you don't want to do that. So instead of training, you want to have awareness. Awareness sessions instead of training. Okay. What is awareness? Well, you're introducing them to the idea. You're not telling them that this is how you must do it, you tell them that here's how you can do it. And here's the benefit of doing it this way. So for example, the lunch and learns, which I know many companies have tried, but some unfortunately have failed. Lunch and learns do work, but there's some key parameters, key things that you have to remember of why it works. So keys to success in lunch and learns. You gotta facilitate them, but don't conduct them. Uh, in this case, what I mean by that is you are there as a facilitator, as an organizer, but you have one of the people who are uh, one of the people in the audience, one of the people in your committee actually doing the presentation and sharing ideas. And you're holding that on a regular basis, <clears throat> once a week or once a month, and you're facilitating the knowledge transfer from peers to peers. That really, really works. Okay, one person presents about what they like and about what they don't like on their intranet. There's got to be both ways. Here's what I love. Here's what I don't love. Here's the frustration I have. Because people need to know that they're in, uh, you know, they're in this together, and that's how it all comes out. And of course, you'll find out also what's frustrating people, and then you can help fix it. Now, of course, don't forget the free food. Everyone likes pizza, and it's cheap. At least it is in the United States. I think I don't think it's that expensive in uh, Europe as well. Uh, you need to provide facilitation, you need to provide some hopefully free food, and for that small budget, you can actually make a big, big difference, especially with the peer-to-peer -peer learning scenario. Not from a uh, conductor like yourself or a SharePoint trainer, but from peer-to-peer. -peer. <clears throat> That's truly, truly important. And the last thing, incentivizing desired behavior. How do you incentivize desired behavior? Well, you need to award them, reward them for things that they're doing. Uh, I've seen companies actually hold an award gala. You know, um, sometimes they have it freestanding by itself, or sometimes it's uh, combined with an existing event. So there's already events that are happening. Why not recognize people in your uh, in your community, in within your SharePoint community, I should say, internally, for people who are helping other people? And how do you do it? Well, you have specific award categories. For example, most participation in discussion boards and news feeds in Yammer, that kind of stuff. Most active in document collaboration. Most shares of content. Or most helpful to colleagues. This is subjective, obviously, but uh, you want to have these metrics pure, uh, clearly defined ahead of time. And then you want to reward people with those things in mind. Now, rewarding honestly doesn't really mean that you have to give a big prize or big reward like that. It could be something small as well, or it could just be a token of appreciation. It could be just having them come to the stage and shaking their hand and patting them on their back. Even those things work without any money altogether. It's about the recognition. Even simpler words, like I was mentioning before, they go a long way. Uh, so, you know, stickers like this and all, they, they have gone a long way as well from what we've seen. One more thing over here, uh, to do all these things, and I went through it pretty quickly, there's lots of different things that you need, that you would be doing to, to make this all happen. And there's a sequential way that you can follow of uh, SharePoint adoption. There's a SharePoint adoption checklist that we have put together, for example. And if you go over here, you can see the checklist. You can quantify your action, uh, understand how communication, making a communication plan, a governance plan, and how do you measure success, all that stuff comes together. 
And once you've checked off all these things, now obviously there might still be things to do, but at least you'll feel good about, okay, uh, this is how most organizations are doing quote unquote SharePoint adoption. So get yours from going to this link and hopefully this helps you. All right, um, I'm gonna pause my screen here for a second and show you that result that I was showing you before. I think it's important for everybody to see <clears throat> the kind of people uh, that are coming to these sessions. So that's why I take that survey. Let me quickly show it. It's coming up. So here's what you have said. Most of the people are on SharePoint Online right now. That's where we are. That's very true. It used to be, this bar used to be very high on SharePoint 2016, but now SharePoint Online is the big, big platform that most people are going to. Which services are they using most? Outlook and SharePoint and OneDrive. These are the main ones that I get again and again from people. Okay, so that's where most people are. It's good to know how many people are using Planner and Forms and Delve, things like that. Delve, actually, I see a lot less people using, especially in Europe. That's a topic for another day. Uh, what is your next migration plan for? Less than six months, six months a year, more than one year. How large is your community? A lot of people that are coming to these type of webinars uh, or these presentations are more than 5,000 users. Increasing user adoption definitely seems to be the number one thing that keeps coming up again and again. That we need more people to be actually using what we're showing, uh, what we're giving them. Okay, so I appreciate all of you who participated into that. Thank you very much. Let me uh, get back here. All right, showing screen again. Okay. So to cover, and by the way, we're going to be doing some questions afterwards, so don't leave just yet. Uh, Five things you can control, the five things that's going to help you with user adoption are following. Just to recap, solve a critical problem. That's definitely number one. Always, always start with what's in it for me. Develop champions and evangelists. Also super important. You will need people on your side to be able to help you. Focus on context, not in, instead of just content. Uh, you need to focus, in my opinion, humbly, on getting the people information, support, training at the right time, at the right place. Offer frequent peer-to-peer -peer learning events, as I mentioned. It's just instructor to attendee, student, doesn't work as well as peer-to-peer. -peer. And then of course have incentives and awards, no matter how small they are. They also work really well as well. Okay, um, I believe I have one last slide over here just with my information. And then David, if you want to go ahead and, uh... oh, actually there's, there's one more thing, sorry. Uh, okay, one last thing over here. So this is me, by the way, Asif Ramani. Uh, there's a user adoption virtual roundtable that I host on a monthly basis. And as you can see, this is a screenshot from one of those user adoption roundtable. Uh, most of the people are from North America. We have a couple from Europe as well. If you email me, asif at uh, I can if you like, I can add you to the round table. In, in there, we actually talk on a monthly basis about the same kind of things that we're talking about here in the presentation. You know, what's working for each, what's not working. People show their own intranet sometimes and talk about challenges and talks about successes. So if you would like to be in this round table, email me, we'll go from there. Uh, you can download my presentations right there. You can learn about Visual SP that I showed you at visualsp.com if you'd like to provide the in-context help using Visual SP, it's right there. Connect with me online as well if you like, and Twitter and my email. And okay, so I hope this presentation was helpful to you. Uh, if you have any questions, we are here for you. David, I'm ready. <laughs> great, thanks Asif, that was that was a great presentation. Um, and you. as um, Asif mentioned, um, if anybody wants to ask a question, please use the question function on your, um, on your webinar um, window. Um, I just have one here, Asif. Um, the question is, how do you know if the adoption efforts uh, you are implementing are working? Yeah, that's a very good question, actually. You know, uh, you're know, you doing all these things, let's say these five things, but your boss asks you, how do you know it's actually working? <laughs> One of the things that one of my attendees told me that, uh, you know, when I asked that question myself also I, in uh, one of my presentations, she's like, well, the support tickets start going down. 
right? The support tickets start going down and that's why you know that adoption is working. People are using it more. And uh, I, I actually disagree with that, in my opinion. Sometimes the support tickets go up because now people are using it more and they're actually having more challenges sometimes of how do I make a new custom list? How do I get a new site? And how do I get permission to this existing site? So support tickets going down is not truly uh, the way to measure it. Some, it. It's the type of support tickets. Are they just people complaining? Or are they people who are motivated and they're struggling with something that, they, that you want them to do anyway? So keep that in mind. Second thing that I learned from uh, Visa Corporation, they did this really, really well, was, uh, look at the custom objects creation frequency. What I mean by custom objects within SharePoint specifically is custom lists, new sites, uh, editing and making new columns within existing lists, right? Uh, making new web parts or plopping in a web part into a existing page. Things that are happening which are more customizing their environment. Get trying to, people trying to get permissions to an existing site. All those kind of events if you are seeing that, that means they're, enga they're engaged. And that engagement also translates into the adoption increase. So there's a few things like that. If you want to know more, you can contact me. I can send you a list of all things, for example, that we learned from Visa Corporation. They had a really good list like that. So let me know, I can send you more as well. Good question. Great. Um, there doesn't seem to be any more questions coming in at the moment, unless anybody else wants to raise a hand or ask a question now. And if you have questions even afterwards, sometimes it happens, obviously, there's not enough time here and you think about, oh man, I wish I had asked this question. Please feel free to email me directly, asif at visualsp.com. I would love to engage and talk to you about it afterwards. Perfect, that's that's great, Asif. Um, so I guess we'll wrap it up then, unless you want to, um, unless there's anything else as if uh, no just one last point over here the the thing that i mentioned the what's in it for me honestly if you started with that and if you started with the why of why do you want people to use it and why should they care that will answer everything afterwards but starting with why and starting with the wifm concept has at least provided success for me and many of our customers our clients and I really, really hope that it provides the same success to you as well. Feel free in the middle, of course, if you have challenges, questions, folks like myself and others in the community are open to taking questions and to help. So feel free to reach out, don't be shy, that we all help each other. And that's the reason the SharePoint community starts with the word share. <laughs> and, uh, and it truly works. We all share a lot of ideas and content. So thank you very much for the opportunity, David. Absolutely, it's a nice, that's a, a nice uh, thought, Asif. I just have one question here from Cara, actually. Um, her question okay. is, how do you describe Teams? How do you describe Teams? Is Microsoft Teams, I think Cara is asking, right? I think so, right, yeah. Yeah, uh, the biggest yes. question that I get is, how do you describe Teams and also how do you differentiate Teams from other mechanism? Um, now, obviously, we all know this is not a secret that Microsoft created Teams because they needed a way, first of all, to have a step up uh, after the evolution of Skype. And second, there's another product called Slack in the market, obviously. Slack is a great product, but Microsoft needed something also in their arsenal to make something that, that that's better, uh, that in, and it combines all technologies together in one way. Slack is a solution, obviously, for chat, for Teams communication and channels for meetings, all that stuff together. To me, it's more like a, uh, a way that people feel together when they're online. A lady I was talking to recently about this, she said, you know what, I recently moved from my team uh, physically. She was in uh, St. Louis, I believe, in Missouri, United States, and she moved to Texas, which is pretty far away. And she said, if it was not for Microsoft Teams, I would have felt very, very disconnected. But because Microsoft Teams is there, I can chat with them, I can communicate with them very, very easily, and I feel like I'm together with them. So at the end of the day, honestly, it's almost like Facebook for within your company, right? Uh, another product that is similar is Yammer. Yammer is also fairly similar to what Teams does. Yammer came from a different company altogether that Microsoft purchased. That's how Yammer got in. 
uh, Yammer is there, Teams is there. Usually Teams works really, really good for people that you know that, that are in your team. And Yammer works really good for big enterprises who want to allow the discovery of other people that you don't know. So it's more of an outer kind of circle and while, while Teams is an inner circle of people that you already know. So I hope that helps. Great. Um, thank you for that. So I think we'll leave it there then, um, if that's okay. And yep. I just want to say thank you once again to Asif for taking the time to complete this webinar. And we really appreciate, appreciate that. My pleasure. Great for being here. Thank you for the opportunity. So finally, um, just want to end the webinar and say that our um, check out our website, sharepointeurope.com for further details on our upcoming webinars. And be sure to visit our resource center um, to see all previous episodes. So thank you all once again for joining. Take care and goodbye. Bye-bye.